Thank you, everyone. I want to welcome all of you, and we appreciate your turnout tonight. I'm Kim Steinke, the president of the League of Women Voters for this year. And we very much are excited about having this presentation this evening. And I think without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Carol Spikehart, who's going to make the introduction of our speaker. So thank you again for coming. Okay, we have with us tonight Peter Sinclair. We're delighted to have you here and to have the Nature Center co-sponsoring this with us. Peter is an independent videographer specializing in climate change and renewable energy. According to Wikipedia, he is an environmental activist. In August of 2013, he was awarded the Herbert Munzel Award for Environmental Activism. He's been a participant in the Dark Snow Project, which I'm guessing he may, you may learn about tonight. He's a monthly contributor to the Yale University Climate Connection, wherein he makes those videos that you can access online. The time we read you the titles of a few of the recent ones. In April, there was Should a Green Deal Include Nuclear Power? In June, what caused this year's bizarre winter and spring weather in the U.S. heartland? And in October, this very month, wind turbines are the new normal in some rural Michigan counties. And so here's Peter. Well, nearby, I don't know. Do I need it? No. Yes? No. no. Let me see it on the table. Try. Someone change the mind. We'll let you know. Okay, so tonight I'm going to talk about, I was asked to come and talk about um, what is really kind of a revolution going on uh, and, and happening here in Midland, or in Michigan and in Midland. Maybe a lot more uh, quickly and more uh, aggressively than a lot of people know about. Uh, yeah, a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm a lifelong Midlander. I've been a, a videographer for the last dozen years or so, specializing in energy and environment. Uh, over that time, I have uh, interviewed and learned from hundreds of some of the world's uh, best and best known scientists and engineers. They become my teachers, uh, and they become my friends, and I'm very pleased that in the last uh, seven or eight years, they've started inviting me out into the field uh, to places like this, which is the Greenland Ice Sheet, uh, where I was last summer. Um, this is actually, this summer is the first uh, in the last seven years that I haven't been on an ice sheet with uh, scientists somewhere. That's uh, when we were camping there. You can see this is all uh, bare rock that was recently uncovered uh, by melting ice. I camped up here, which was a mistake because I broke my ribs getting up there. <laughs> but it was real pretty and I had some white noise just from the waterfall there. Uh, but I'm very grateful to the scientists and I I like to think that they have enough confidence in me to take me to some of these places because um, I try really hard to get it right. And tonight I'm going to talk about uh, energy and the way we produce energy, and I'm going to try to bring that same uh, commitment to, to getting it right uh, to that topic as well. So uh, yeah, that's uh, all part of Dark Snow Project, which is a international scientific team, and we can talk more about that later. So, about a year ago, I was standing in the rain uh, over in Co Township, Isabella County, watching one of the last wind turbines go up there uh, at a big development, which is, for the moment, Michigan's largest wind development. Uh, you've seen these turbines if you've driven down by Mount Pleasant. Very interesting project because uh, these folks in Co Township and Pine River Township have been watching uh, for almost a decade now uh, the experience of the folks uh, in Breckenridge, where we've had a pretty uh, good sized wind development now for that period of time. And having looked at it pretty carefully, uh, these folks decided 
that looks pretty good. We'd like to do that too. And so they went ahead and just to the north of them in Isabella County, uh, folks there have gone ahead and they've got what will be the largest development just permitted and uh, starting to uh, 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 be developed right there. And to the east uh, here in Midland County, uh, uh, Mount Haley and Porter Township and then uh, Jonesfield Township and Saginaw have also been looking at that uh, experience in Breckenridge and decided they would like to get on board as well. And this is, this, is very, uh, this is very encouraging because people, uh, when they are exposed to renewable energy, they see the benefits that are happening in the communities. They find out that some of the negative stuff that they hear is not true. And uh, so mid-Michigan is becoming kind of a hotbed for wind energy and increasingly solar. Uh, we, I was just up in Hope Township uh, last night or last week where they have permitted a 20-acre uh, uh, solar farm that will be going out there near, in the Eatonville area. Uh, we're getting uh, a huge development in Chiawassee, uh, another one in, in Eaton County that I was uh, just uh, getting advised about the other day. And so you're going to see a lot more solar. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, both wind and solar. Uh, most of the numbers that we have in Michigan are about wind, but, uh, but there's, uh, there's certain things that are common to both of them. So people in Michigan want renewable energy. Uh, Michigan State uh, did a poll uh, recently of Michiganders and found out that they overwhelmingly support the transition to solar and wind energy uh, away from coal-fired uh, and, and Michigan has been primarily uh, powered by coal-fired energy over the last few decades. 86% favored wind, 5% uh, opposes wind, uh, about 90 plus percent uh, favor solar. And um, what we're talking about when we, uh, when we are uh, imagining a grid that is powered by uh, renewable energy is something fundamentally different than what we're used to. Um, you can think of the, the traditional electric grid that we've had for the last hundred years uh, like a bicycle uh, wheel. And if the, the middle of the wheel is a power plant and the spokes are all wires and all around the wheel are all of us and we're all drawing power from that central power plant. And that's more or less the way things have gone for a hundred years. But now we're moving to something different, something that looks uh, more like a spider's web. It's intentionally looking more like the internet. So instead of like a one, one or a small number of power plants and uh, the rest of us all kind of dependent on them, we have like a network that is going to have first hundreds, then thousands, then hundreds of thousands, and maybe eventually millions of little nodes, each capable of generating, transmitting, and storing energy, much like the internet transmits and stores and creates information. So uh, I was, I had a, a very interesting experience uh, about a month ago um, I was invited by uh, one of the uh, state's large utilities to come uh, sit at a table and listen to the CEO of the other large utility in the state, Patty Poppy, uh, gave a talk right over here at the, the Great Hall. And some of you that are old time middle residents might remember that uh, about four years ago, there was kind of a, a controversy in, in the town of, in regard to consumers' energy and, and the energy choices that we were going to make. And I learned a whole lot from that. And uh, I was actually uh, listening to uh, the CEO of Consumers talk, and it seemed to me that she'd been cribbing off my notes. And this was a pretty uh, interesting experience. And I'm going to talk about that some more, but I want you to hear just a little slice of her talk. She's talking about 
the transition that our major utilities are starting to finally get and really integrate into their thinking and, and why they're thinking the way they are uh, just in the last few years. You know, post-World War II, electric demand was was at a huge steep, steep incline. Farms were being electrified. Factories were coming online. That we were fueling the this great economy of Michigan, and we needed to build plants as fast as humanly possible. And the the reliable, affordable fuel that was available widely was coal, and it did its job. It created the economy that's been so prosperous here in Michigan. But the formula has changed now. Demand flat at best, and if we do our job, it might even decline. The per capita demand is definitely declining. So we support growth in Michigan and Michigan's prosperity, but the actual per capita usage can go down as buildings are more efficient, lighting's more efficient, HVAC's more efficient, we all know that. So given that, we have the opportunity of a generation to determine with what will we replace these big central station base load power plants. We will replace them with modular renewables because it's smarter. Let me show you why. If you don't have certainty in your demand curve, you don't want to take a big bet and overbuild a big power plant. And actually without the increasing demand, that's just a cost that we would all bear. We go through a very technical modeling um, exercise to say, based on future worlds and projections that we have, um, what are the resources that this technical model says is the best thing for customers long term. And when we offered in natural gas units and we offered in solar and wind and uh, what we would call local management resources, which are virtual power plants, you see the model, which is all it's driven towards, is picking the least cost option for customers. And what the capital cost projections that we see for, uh, or have forecasted for renewables, especially solar, the model really loved uh, picking that type of resource. It was the most economic choice for customers, along with the energy efficiency programs as well. And so if we can modularly add renewables, and we can, we can modularly add those renewables to match demand more timely. At the right time, we can add the supply we need two megawatts at a time. If we're gonna build a gas plant, it's gonna be a thousand megawatts. That's the minimum like efficient size. In the past, you would see that natural gas has been extremely competitive in the resource that you would want to select. But when you start competing and you see cost declines on these renewable resources, you now see them being chosen over these long-term natural gas units. And so that's, that's the way we used to have to think about it. We don't have to think about it that way now. We can add these modular renewables and tackle energy waste. Everybody get that? Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, the decline in demand. Yeah. I mean, I see it the, you know, with current uh, you know, domestic infrastructure. There's more and more of us are driving electric cars, get rid of our gas grinders, get rid of our gas stoves, get rid of our gas water heaters. I think demand's gonna go up. Um, actually, it will depend on when we choose to, to charge those electric cars, okay? Because that's what we call a flexible load. And we can we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's a really great question. But uh, basically, that smart spider web grid of the future is going to be generating electricity 24 hours a day. And the time of day when you're most likely to be uh, not driving your car, it happens to be the time of day when wind tends to blow more strongly and there is less demand on other parts of the grid. So moving uh, demand around like that, it sort of gives you what they call a virtual power plant. So. Uh, Again, this is a more intelligent grid. It's a different way of thinking about things, and it's it's it it takes some time to wrap your mind around it. So, Scientific American says wind energy is one of the cheapest sources of electricity and getting cheaper. I will show you what uh, uh, the uh, elite experts in energy 
industry and are looking at in terms of costs for new generation. This comes from an international accounting firm called Lazard. Uh, and this is sort of the gold standard of uh, electrical generation cost. This is what the people at, on Wall Street, uh, big investors, look at. And uh, just to help you see it a little bit better, uh, these are costs of new generation, unsubsidized. Uh, here's wind, which is cheaper is this way, more expensive is this way. Okay, so you can see that in 2018, Wind is coming in as the cheapest, is a range. Uh, solar coming up fast on the outside. Uh, gas uh, is still compelling and competitive in, in, many, uh, in many areas, but it is coming under a lot of competition. So for the last decade or so, this, uh, this competition between wind and gas has been the big story, the one that everybody's talking about, wind or gas. And that led me to one of the most inspired uh, headlines ever in my, in my blog, uh, Will Gas Be Our Men Will Gas Gas? <laughs> Try to have fun. <laughs> so I want to show you uh, a short mishmash of, of news reports here. You're going to see uh, a Reuters news agency report. Uh, that talks about the economics of both wind and solar. You're going to see some uh, corporate executives here. You're going to see some uh, uh, economics reporters that you may be familiar with. You're going to see uh, Andrew Liveris. Uh, this was uh, recorded when he was still CEO of Dow. And you'll see uh, uh, the young lady from Consumers Energy, Joyce Wazowski. And you'll also see a, a gentleman from uh, the energy ministry in Germany. So I'll just let this speak for itself. From Walmart to General Motors, the titans of business are becoming some of the biggest buyers of renewable energy, such as wind and solar power. But the shift isn't all about becoming better stewards of the environment. CEOs are learning that going green is a good way to control costs. The renewables have dropped in prices where they're very competitive to even natural gas. The cost of wind and solar power has come down dramatically over the last few years. So buying power from a wind farm or a solar energy facility is actually cost competitive with buying fossil fuel generated power from the grid. Wind power costs have plunged 66% since 2009, while the cost to install solar has declined 70% since 2010. For big companies, that's adding up to millions of dollars in savings. GM, which plans to get all of its power from clean energy by 2050, says it's saving $5 million a year worldwide using renewables. But ultimately our goal is to be powered 100% by clean renewable energy. See, when I speak to a lot of companies, particularly companies like a Google, uh, like an Amazon, they want no footprint. They want to have a renewable footprint. They want their utilities to do it. They certainly tell me coal is dead. Solar has fallen uh, roughly 80% since 2009. Uh, wind has fallen 50% such that both are now at or below conventional technologies unsubsidized. Look at our renewable energy already, when how many jobs it has, the solar, wind, and Mars. We're gonna keep supporting that. This is Advantage America. 37% of our electricity production is done by renewables. The vast majority is done by wind and photovoltaics. And I can tell you what, the grid is extremely stable. We have grid uh, um, disruption a year at about 12 minutes. So 12 minutes a year is effectively nothing. If you said uh, cost competitiveness for a customer is $45 per megawatt, something like that, that would be where we would say we gotta hit that or lower. And I know that as a company, we've solicited and we've gone into contracts with wind facilities that are at that $45, $44 per, per megawatt cost. And that tells us that in reality, we can see these costs declining to competitive levels now. And if they continue to come in at those ranges, then they'll could become more and more a, a resource that we would want to have for our customers. So, not too many months ago, Wall Street Journal agreed global investment in wind and solar is outshining fossil fuels. Uh, about double the amount of money uh, in 2016 went to 
renewable solar and wind versus uh, nuclear coal, gas, and fuel oil powered plants. And they quote uh, an expert from MIT, wind and solar now represent the lowest cost option for generating electricity. So this is, this is not some kind of avant-garde idea. This is a basically mainstream uh, 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 wisdom at this point. Now the state that knows wind energy the best and has the biggest uh, penetration by percent of renewable energy is Iowa. Uh, this article from the Cedar Rapids Gazette points out that wind power has been saving Iowans on energy costs. And so over the last 20 years, because they've been uh, at this now for a while, they're spending about half a cent less per kilowatt hour uh, than the national average uh, while the rest of us are paying about half a cent more. So going hard into renewable energy has been very advantageous for Iowa, and that's why high-tech companies like Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and Google are flocking to Iowa, uh, making something they call the Silicon Prairie, um, because they have a world-class power grid, according to Apple CEO Tim Cook. Um, so companies like Google and Facebook have cut deals with Iowa to let them use 100% uh, renewable energy on these data centers. Uh, we're actually starting to see this happen in Michigan as well. There's a big company called Switch, uh, and they built this data center down by uh, Grand Rapids. A data center is kind of where the internet lives. If you've seen that commercial about the Microsoft Cloud, it's not a cloud. It's a data center. It's a building that's full of computers and hard drives that uses a tremendous amount of electricity and it needs a very, very specifically high quality of electricity. Uh, and uh, this particular company, uh, when they were scouting for a location, uh, first question was, can you get us the power we need? Second question was, can you get us 100% renewable power? Because if you can't, they weren't interested. So because we had a robust uh, wind industry here in Michigan, we were able to cut that deal with them. So they came and they brought the largest single outside capital investment in the history of the state of Michigan, $5 billion and 1,000 jobs. So the point that I make over and over again to people around the state is when we are talking about the jobs from rural en renewable energy, we're not just talking about solar installers or wind energy technicians. Uh, we're talking about jobs at mainstream companies. Uh, companies like General Motors, who has 100% renewable goal. Ford and Dow, that have very aggressive renewable energy goals. Companies like Switch, that have 100% renewable energy goal. Google, Yahoo, Facebook. These are companies that simply won't come to your area or won't grow in your area if you don't have renewable energy to offer them because that is, that is their blueprint going forward. That is the way they see themselves uh, because they are advanced science-based companies. That's the, what, what they want to be in the future. Dow Chemical uh, has a very uh, advanced uh, purchase of wind energy and solar energy they are now powering their Freeport, Texas manufacturing site uh, entirely on wind. It's the largest uh, complex of its kind in the Western Hemisphere, so it's a crown jewel in their portfolio, now powered uh, entirely by wind. Uh, according to the press release, uh, they are going that way. And remember, they chose wind over gas in Texas, right? in part because they said it would give them a long-term competitive advantage because it's a hedge against power price volatility. Power price volatility. Well, I've been following the price of gas and I think it's going to be a topic of an upcoming video because it's very interesting right now. Um, the, the price of, of gas uh, is very competitive right now. But it can only go up, and uh, all the more so because we're now starting to uh, export gas. Uh, gas, 15 years ago, was not something you could really send overseas. There wasn't any kind of a pipeline to send it overseas. But now, 
we have these giant compressed liquefied gas tankers that can send gas all over the world. So that means uh, uh, people like us in America are now competing against consumers in places like Japan where they pay three times as much for gas as we do here. So uh, for a number of reasons, we expect the price of gas to go up, but when uh, you can sign a 15 to 20 year contract and know exactly what your price is going to be uh, two decades in the future and bean counters love that. And it actually, it gives you a competitive advantage because you know that you're not going to have to spend extra money on fuel and that uh, uh, frees up resources for uh, doing all the good things that companies like to do, like hire people and make stuff. So what we're seeing in places like Texas, because they have a lot of wind and increasingly a lot of solar there, and, and so much of it, uh, in fact, that it's getting ahead of our grid. Our grid is rapidly approaching uh, third world status obsolescence because much of it was built 50, 60, 70 years ago. And this is part of that infrastructure that we've been screaming about for, for decades and that we can't get anybody to work on. But what it means is, we can't always get the electricity out to people that will buy it. And so in places like Texas, uh, we're seeing uh, occasional days during the year when prices actually fall to zero and then fall below zero, which means uh, they pay you to take the electricity. Uh, it's, it's not the desirable thing, but it gives you an idea of how fast this is coming on. Uh, actually, Texas has a tremendous amount of uh, renewable energy. Uh, same situation in Germany. They are also trying to build out their uh, uh, transmission grid, but even so, uh, prices are dipping below zero in Germany. Uh, one utility that has a creative solution in San Antonio, they have a nighttime special, save the dishwashing and, and laundry until after nine o'clock, the electricity is free because the wind blows hard in Texas at night. So, Motley Fool says the transition is happening because utilities see the economics as simply too good to pass up. So, uh, AEP, this is a, a, a planning document for AEP, which is a big utility in the uh, uh, eastern United States that I started doing a little bit of consulting for. but. So their plan for the next dozen years or so is a lot of solar, a lot of wind, a little bit of gas. And that is pretty much what you see across the board uh, in, in utilities. And it's moving more and more every month in the direction of the solar and wind. So speaking of solar, um, Solar is exploding. It's a, it's, the curve is a little bit behind the wind curve, but uh, many people say that the growth is going to be uh, uh, explosive and mind-blowing in, in the next, uh, in the coming decade. We're, we're seeing it, uh, we're starting to see it here in, in Michigan. Uh, many areas are starting to see it, and, and it's really a question of uh, lawmakers and regulators trying to catch up with the technology, which is moving so fast. Um, Germany, of course, is well known uh, for their uh, uh, pioneering uh, uh, ventures in solar energy. They've done a lot of it. Um, and so there's been a lot of Germany bashing from the usual suspects. And so I, I love this little clip from uh, Fox News where they're discussing how is, how is it that those Germans are doing so well with, with solar energy? What, that can't be true. What's that all about? And what was Germany doing correct? Are they just a smaller country and made more? They're a smaller country and they've got lots of sun, right? right? They've got a lot more sun than we do. The... Right. <laughs> so I, I do, you know, um, I have a sort of a public service here because we haven't been at war with Germany in a long time. Many people have forgotten where it was. Um, it is a small northern European country, kind of cloudy, on the same latitude as uh, Labrador, Canada. And if you look at the actual solar resource across the United States, this is from the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, 
Red is really good. Yellow is pretty damn good. A green is still darn good. Blue, maybe not so great. This is Germany. Okay. And if you look at sort of a continuum down here, this graph, uh, Germany actually has a, less of a solar resource than Alaska. And yet they decided that they would lead the world. And they are. Uh, whereas the rest of the United States, mainland the USA, on the average, uh, has a solar resource about as good as Hawaii, which is pretty interesting. So, uh, it's, it is a question. At one point, the, the, we were investing in actually making the panels, and then companies supposedly started going out of business or they right. weren't getting the subsidies, and China was overtaking us. Yeah, yeah. Where do we stand now? Well, China makes a lot of things really cheap. You know, uh, there is actually one of the largest, if not the largest, maker of the solar panels. Uh, it's still in the United States. First Solar is based in Ohio. They do a little bit of manufacturing in Michigan. Uh, and of course, Hemlock Semiconductor, right down the road here, uh, makes the raw material that goes into not just solar panels, but computer chips. And, polycrystal and silicon. So we do uh, get a, a fair piece of that, that pie, but uh, obviously I mean, it, it's very tough to compete with China. However, more and more that type of activity is being automated, so you know, uh, these things move really fast because the bean counters are always, you know, slicing it really fine, and so uh, I don't think anybody really knows how how that's going to settle out in the future. But but right now it's it's a tight race, and we really haven't we haven't been hitting on all cylinders in the United States. We're, we haven't really been joined in this. We we have pioneered so many of these technologies, and then we've let other countries kind of take the lead on them. And I think that's a shame. But maybe we can change that. So yeah, the price of of uh, of uh, photovoltaic solar since 1977 has been, I think, coming down. Uh, my, my science uh, friends always tell me, be very careful when you look at a graph. Don't just eyeball a graph and think that you detect a trend. But I'm going to go out on a graph and say, I think there's a trend here. And uh, this just takes us up to 2013, and I, I bet if we could focus in on that, and zoom in on that, that we would see that kind of continuing down more or less on the same uh, sort of a grade. So uh, it's explosive. Uh, here's uh, an array of solar panels. Uh, this one is large enough to power 9,000 homes. It is in Lapeer, Michigan, and for a brief Second there, Lincoln, you might have missed it, it was actually the largest solar array east of the Mississippi. Uh, that is no longer the case because so many uh, large ones are now going up. There's several larger ones uh, under construction in Michigan right now, and it's uh, really hard to keep track. I don't know if anybody is keeping track anymore because it's, uh, it's simply ex exploding. Can you give us an idea on Anchorage? It's hard to yeah. from there. Right, that particular one is um, it's 250 acres, so uh, you're only kind of seeing a partial. I, I snuck up over and put my drone over it and can't tell. Can't tell. <laughs> yeah. Do those little solar panels move and follow the sun? Those don't. I, I, I've been there and, and they're, they're fixed. Uh, they're, they're kind of, they're like on a 45 degree tilt and they face south, so they get probably a pretty good average. But uh, now the one, for instance, the one up in Hope Township that uh, they just permitted up there is going to have some sort of tracking mechanism. So uh, different strokes for you know different folks. But that was basically, that one that I just showed you, that was built by DTE, which is the big utility, and I think they were just kind of trying to get their toes wet a little bit and see um, what this actually looks like. And so they just wanted a basic unit. And uh, from everything that I've heard, uh, I've talked to some higher level people there, they're pretty pleased and they expect to be doing 
a lot more. So I want to, I, so I go around to a lot of communities where people have questions about renewable energy. You should know that there is a uh, very well-funded, very well-organized uh, pushback against renewable energy that is funded in good part by the coal industry. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, uh, popping up, especially in, in rural areas, because many, many of these things, most of these things are cited in rural areas. And uh, so I have found myself over the last two and a half years going to a lot of these um, little township meetings that nobody ever goes to. And then all of a sudden, the, the playbook is, uh, when one of these projects, either wind or solar, gets announced, then 20, 30, or 40 angry people show up. And they've all been on Facebook and reading toxic uh, memes on Facebook. And they're, they think that there's some kind of deep state conspiracy to shoot invisible beams at them or something. And they're really angry about it. And, uh, and this has actually been uh, a formidable challenge, uh, and uh, actually, uh, I managed to I managed to convince uh, nine or ten solar and wind developers now that they need help with communication, and and we're starting to do some pretty good pushback. Um, but this is one of the questions that comes up a lot uh, in these discussions. Of course, what happens when the wind stops or the sun goes down? Mr. Smart Dad Scientist. Um, so, uh, wind and, and solar are looked widely known as sort of intermittent, we call them intermittent energy, meaning sometimes they're here, sometimes they're not. Okay, fair enough, but the dirty little secret that power engineers have known for a century is that all power sources are intermittent, and you can't build any kind of a power plant unless you show regulators what you're going to do if the thing breaks. Because in anything mechanical is going to go down from time to time or have to be re refueled or maintained or, or something. So uh, I'll give you an example. This is Perry Nuclear Plant, which is on the uh, uh, shore of Lake Erie. And a uh, little uh, paper there. In, uh, I can't remember the name of the town in Ohio, but anyway, uh, they were covering a milestone for the Perry Nuclear Plant last April because they, uh, they, they refueled, which is something you have to do with a nuclear plant every 18 months or so. And it takes four to six weeks. So they shut down the nuclear plant, and they actually they had a 27-day shutdown, which was the record. It was their shortest refueling ever in their history. So it meant that 1,200 megawatts, which is a lot of power, had to come off the grid for four weeks while they were refueling. And, uh, and, and the lights didn't go off in Ohio because we know how to do this. We have a grid and we balance things out. We have different uh, generators all feeding into the grid. And particularly with this, because it's a planned shutdown, everybody knew it was going to happen. Uh, and they just they just moved like right through. Uh, now they they got it rolling again, but three months later in July there was some kind of a little glitch, uh, a turbine trip, I think is what they call it, uh, and they shut down unexpectedly on July 27th. And as of this report on July 31st, was still not back up. So that's a case of 1,200 megawatts going offline in an instant, uh, totally unexpectedly, okay? Which is something that would not happen with renewable energy, for instance. And uh, just totally by the by, the by uh, Ohio is kind of an interesting case right now because they just approved a uh, billion dollars in financial subsidies for uh, not just uh, Ohio nuclear plants, but also uh, they're going to subsidize uh, coal plants in Ohio, and they're taking away some of the uh, uh, incentives 
for renewable energy. So Ohio right now has about one of the worst energy uh, policies in the country. Uh, it's at literally the worst of all worlds. And you, you can there are there are <coughs> good arguments for keeping nuclear plants, especially existing nuclear plants, in uh, in operation. And I'm sympathetic to that. Uh, but subsidizing nuclear and subsidizing coal, it seems like shooting yourself in the foot a couple of different ways. So anyway, for a coal plant, we expect it to be down about 44 days a year. A nuclear plant, about 36 days a year. And of course, we have that refueling every 17 months. For, say, 100 wind turbines, you might expect one or two of them to be down at any one time. Okay, and the rest of them, of course, as long as the wind blowing, they're still running. The challenge you have with a uh, conventional plant is that it can be cooking along and suddenly go off in the blink of an eye. And that is the challenge for engineers. But it's a challenge we've been meeting for a century. With, say, a wind or solar uh, facility, what you have is a slow, gradual kind of variable power that is, and this is very important, predictable. We know when the sun's coming up, we know when it's going down, we know when the weather's going to be cloudy, we know when there's going to be wind, and we know with a pretty good uh, degree of accuracy uh, several days in advance. So this is a graph that comes from France in December of 2011, and what you're going to see here is a prediction for the uh, wind resource over the course, I think this is the course of a month. And uh, then you're going to see, uh, you'll see the prediction, and then you're going to see what actually happened, okay? So there's the prediction, like 24 hours in advance, and there's the actual, okay? So this, so your engineers, uh, we, we would argue that the biggest variable for the engineers is not the resource. They know exactly what the resource is going to be and they know how to move things around. Uh, the biggest variable is what's the de demand going to be. You know, uh, if, if, uh, if it's the Super Bowl, I don't think they have the Super Bowl in France, but you know, <laughs> uh, more famous story about halftime at Super Bowl and everybody you know, turns on the microwave or something. Uh, that's, that's the hard part. So, um, this is a very interesting uh, piece that I found uh, online. This guy, David Sagow, is the CEO of uh, Great River Energy, which is the second largest utility in Minnesota. They have some coal, they have a lot of wind. And uh, this is just a little slice of a recent talk that he gave to shareholders, but I think it, uh, it helps you to understand the, the depth of the transition that we're going through. The wind is a great resource. Uh, it, it has gotten predictable. We've gotten very good at predicting when the wind is going to blow. The transmission system is, is able to handle the intermittency uh, of all of this wind. It has no emissions. It has no variable costs. It's relatively inexpensive. What's not to like? We, we say at GRE, we're big fans of big fans. And I'm sorry for that, and I, I should have apologized in advance if that was if that was going on. But we really we really do like wind. But one thing that is, one thing that that is occurring uh, in the past, we tended to think of our baseload resources, our coal resources, as baseload, and every other resource being supplemental to that, regardless of what it was. Well, that's been turned on its head now. I would suggest to you that wind is quickly becoming the new, the new baseload. And to be viable going forward, all other sources of generation must be flexible enough to be supplemental to the wind. Pretty interesting, eh? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I posted that on Facebook and got all kinds of hate uh, <laughs> blowback on that. But, uh, you know, it, it, it is tough to wrap our minds around because we're not used to thinking in this way. But the guys who are managing utilities are, are this is what they're dealing with every day. This, this, is, uh, this is now the new normal for them. And this is the wild card that five years ago no one would have predicted. This is uh, actually a battery. 
Uh, and if you look at over here, if your eyes are good, you can read the word Tesla, which of course is the gland of a company and everybody wants one of their cars, I sure do, honey. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, anyway, they, the, the, the actual investment pros will tell you that, that their real technology is not the car, it's the battery. And this battery is in uh, Australia. It's the world's largest, for the moment, uh, lithium-ion battery. And this came about because Elon Musk, who's the guiding genius behind that company, uh, got into a bit of a, I don't know, maybe they were drunk or something, but they got into a, a, a little bit of a, a argument uh, on Twitter, but Elon and some billionaire in, in Australia. And so Elon ended up making a bet that he could build the world's biggest battery and then he'd do it in a hundred days and if he couldn't, then it would be free. Wow. And he did. He won the bet. So uh, that uh, came online in December of 2017. He beat his 100 day construction deadline. And not two weeks later, a big coal plant tripped off in the, the general area there. The battery stepped up with a, within a few milliseconds and uh, kept the grid coming along exactly as it was supposed to do. And as a result, the company that uh, owned the battery started making a whole lot of money. Which, uh, in the financial world, when that happens, people start paying attention. And as a result, there are now uh, number of very large batteries like this. Uh, this is a, this one's 100 megawatts. Now we're seeing 200 and larger batteries like this being built uh, around the world, but here in the United States. Uh, so are they solar or wind? That one uh, is, uh, there is a <coughs> wind farm right there. Okay. And uh, so, uh, it's it, technically they don't have to be like right in proximity to each other because as long as the wires are all connected. So so basically, when there's more electricity on the grid, say at night the wind's blowing, and instead of just like shedding that load and not doing anything with it, now we have a place to store it. And this is very important. This applies to Michigan too. We're coming to that. So, but this is the beauty of the battery is that you can time shift. Because uh, just just as in the uh, uh, it can be very very sunny uh, in the middle of the day, and uh, it happens that uh, that usually coincides with our peak uh, usage, although not quite. It's like you want to because because it's sort of like we all come home and eat dinner around six seven o'clock, so that that's really when the the heaviest load is. So if we can just shift that a couple hours, we can we can take advantage of that peak solar at three or four in the afternoon and just move it over a little bit. You know, that's the beauty of these batteries. Uh, I'm gonna play you a little Australian news report that talks about uh, how this is working and, and why uh, this is such a, a successful project. Naysayers said it was a waste of money. But this big battery is already playing a key role in stabilising the grid. And it's doing so with a speed, precision and agility that's never been seen before. Conventional generators can't match the way the battery makes small adjustments to power supply to keep the grid at the right frequency. This is the market operator's instruction. This is the response of a conventional power station. The battery is far swifter and more accurate. We set something on the system and the automated protection kicks in, then a battery can operate at around 200 to 250 milliseconds, so very much sub one second response to be able to protect the systems. Doing that on numerous occasions over the past 10 months as ageing coal-fired power plants in the eastern states have broken down. Absolutely, and, and not just showing up South Australia, showing up the entire grid. While undercutting the price big power generators charge for these frequency control services. It's basically providing much needed competition to a very concentrated segment of the electricity market. And we've been you know, quite pleasantly surprised and, and would encourage more of this technology into the grid. It's coming. 
Stephen Long, ABC News, Hornsdale. So, so the battery doesn't just store electricity for maybe when you need it later. It also provides an ongoing service to the grid. And I'm not an engineer, but basically you have to control like frequency and things like that on a just microsecond to microsecond basis to, to get the best performance on your grid and keep things from blowing up. And these batteries do a really nice job of it. So uh, that is sort of a, a, a side benefit that is really important. So as I said, more and more people want to get in on this. And not too long after that battery went into service, uh, the big utility out in uh, western central United States, Excel, put out a request for proposals. They wanted to see what kind of proposal they could get for wind or solar or wind and solar with battery storage. Okay. And they started getting uh, proposals back that basically rocked the industry. Uh, $21 a megawatt hour for wind with battery storage. Um, how cheap is that? Uh, we'll go back to our graph here. Wind in 2018 came in as the cheapest uh, new source of generation at a range between $29 and $56 a megawatt hour. So the, the proposals that Excel is now getting are for $21 dollars a megawatt hour with storage okay so this is why they call it a disruptive technology it's disruptive it's like the internet it's just going to blow things up okay and that's why utilities like DTE and consumers energy are not just making these changes because they're nice people although they're nice people they're doing it because they want to survive and they know that if they don't change, if they don't pivot really hard, it's like trying to turn the Titanic. They have the wheel completely cranked right now, and they're hoping that they can make the turn in time before this kind of disruption uh, takes them right off the map. And if you don't believe that that kind of disruption is possible, next time you talk to a millennial, ask them what a Kodak is. <laughs> right things happen fast uh, so Wall Street Journal says uh, agrees big batteries are taking bite out of the market lower cost than traditional generation this is spectacular uh, Bloomberg Energy Finance reported about six months ago the levelized cost for lithium-ion batteries has now fallen 35% since the first half of 2018, so in like, what, a year, it fell 35%. Disruptive. Disruptive. And um, so batteries co-located with solar and wind projects starting to compete in many markets without subsidy for the provision of, here's the magic words, dispatchable power. Dispatchable means power when I want it 24 7. Yes? Is there enough lithium in the world? Good question. I think the answer is yes. But uh, and, and we're going to talk more about that. Uh, this is a question that comes up because lithium is something that has to be mined, it's a dirty process. Uh, but um, we're all walking around with lithium-ion batteries. So uh, we're going to be using them for a while, and we better insist that the companies that we buy lithium-ion batteries from do a good job in sourcing that and making sure that uh, uh, you know we don't make a problem or we don't need to make one. OK. Uh, but don't think that um, don't think that the batteries that we have today are the only kind of battery that there is or that are, are the batteries that we will have 10 years from now. Now there's a whole lot of research going on with different kinds of batteries and I'm not going to talk about 
uh, all of those uh, right now. What's interesting for us here in Michigan is that we already have and have had for uh, 40 years one of the world's largest batteries right here on our doorstep, the uh, Ludington Pump Storage Power Plant that most people are not aware of was built back in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it was actually supposed to run in tandem with the Midland Nuclear Plant uh, and, uh, and one of the uh, Fermi plants down south because the, the nuclear plant, the nuclear plants, can't, you can't ramp them down. When the demand goes down, you can't, you can't bring them down because it, you break them. They have to run full blast all the time. So the idea was, we'll have this big storage unit. This is a battery, okay? And we'll use this battery to store that power from the nuclear plant when uh, people don't need it, like 3 a.m. on Sunday morning. So the way it works is very simple. Uh, uh, say it's 3 a.m. Uh, and your nuclear plant is going, or the wind is blowing, and you don't have a lot of demand, use that electricity to pump water out of Lake Michigan up into this big <coughs> lake. You hold it there, maybe two or three days later, heat wave, everybody turns on their air conditioning, you need the power, open up the gates, water comes down, you're generating power, it's a big battery. But I'm gonna let uh, Patty Poppy explain how that fits in their new scheme of things. Ludington Pump Storage is the great engineering marvel, one of the great engineering marvels of the world. It is the fourth largest battery in the world. It has six units. I, I don't know how familiar you are, if you've ever visited, but you should because it's gorgeous. It's the most gorgeous power plant in the world. On the banks of Lake Michigan, pumps water up into a 27 billion gallon reservoir, and we have the six largest motors in the world. Each unit has a 500,000 horsepower motor. And those six largest motors in the world pump the water up. They, were, they power the pumps to take the water up into the reservoir. And then when we need the power, those motors rotate and reverse generate electricity. 2,200 megawatts of carbon-free, emission-free, clean, pure Michigan power. Today, we fill the reservoir once a day. But when we have fully deployed those five and then 6,000 megawatts of solar. We'll have excess power in the day. California is dealing with this and they're concerned about what do you do with extra power in the daytime. In Arizona these days, between the hours of 11 a.m. and 2 p.m., we get uh, negatively priced electricity from California. There's so much solar being produced in California, they can't use it all. They push it to, to Arizona during those hours and pay our utilities to take it off the grid. And guess what we're going to do with it? We're going to pump and fill the reservoir at Ludington. And then we're going to use that reservoir to serve the peak load. And then at night, our wind farms generating extra electricity will also then refill the pond. And we're going to get to refill that pond twice a day because of the upgrade we've done on those motors. That is exciting. That's a, that doubles the capacity of that battery for the service of people of Michigan and the inclusion then in our clean energy plan. So, uh, and there are other there are other plans too. There because uh, uh, good news, bad news. Uh, the bad news is we don't have a national uh, approach to dealing with uh, renewable energy. The good news is uh, all 50 states, each one has a, a different plan that they're trying, and every utility has a different uh, approach to how they're doing it. Uh, in Vermont. Uh, Green Mountain Power is a small utility that is experimenting with making available to their customers one of these Tesla batteries, they're called a power wall. So it's a battery that fits in your home, looks kind of kind of sweet, kind of nice, and uh, it will store electricity and, and they, they, uh, they make it avail available to you uh, for a $1,500 one-time fee or 15 bucks a month, which is a, a great deal because they're about a seven or eight thousand dollar unit so basically you can have it for almost nothing the only catch is when they need the power 
they get to take a certain percentage out of your unit. They won't, they won't leave you high and dry, but they get to move power around, okay? And we're, now we're starting to think about that. Remember the spider web, the network? This is, this is that. And think ahead five years, because in five years, you won't have to be buying a power wall because you may very well have an electric car in your garage of about the same or greater capacity and that will be plugged in and can become part of the network and the big auto companies who were fighting this idea up until just uh, not too long ago have now decided yeah they like this idea and they think that the batteries they're putting in cars will be uh, capable of providing this kind of service so that's where you start getting into that spider web of not just uh, hundreds of thousands but millions millions of these you know, use of energy for an average house could one of those batteries go? That's a great question, uh, and I don't know the answer. Um, uh, I'm gonna. So the 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 Tesla uh, cars, have, and I'm assuming this battery is probably on a similar. You know, you've got uh, maybe thirty kilowatt hours or something like that, thirty to fifty. Uh, that's, a, that's a guess, but I think it's in that range. So, you know, it would run your house for maybe a, a half a day, day, depending on how, how much dry you're, you're putting this home, you know? So anyway, uh, the, the point, one of the big points that I try to make to some of these small communities is that above and beyond our shifting away from fossil fuels, there are huge advantages that come to the local communities. And if you've driven back and forth across rural Michigan, as I have for the last two and a half years, and many of you probably just know this, it's heartbreaking, it's heartbreaking to see what is happening to some of our small rural communities that are wasting away. The manufacturing base has gone. It's no wonder that we have uh, an opioid crisis that we do, and this is not just Michigan, but across the whole Midwest. And <clears throat> it, it, it is sort of a, a, a side effect of the way that we generate electricity that um, the way that we've done it in the past, where there's a power plant someplace 100 miles away, and every time we turn on a light, electricity comes in but money goes away so the way that we've been generating electricity is sucks resources out of local communities somewhere to a bank in new york basically but when we put in we start putting in renewable energy solar and wind then each of these communities uh townships villages small business small businesses farmers become generators producers of electricity and now when you turn on the light switch the money is coming into the communities and and you may have noticed uh, that uh, politically power follows money <laughs> and when we're continually sucking money out of communities, we're sucking power and, and choices out of those communities. And a big crisis that we have in our rural communities is this feeling of powerlessness that people have. But the communities that have wind farms and increasingly solar farms are now seeing, uh, and we can, we can go into this in more depth, but they're now seeing the kind of resources that really allow them to do a whole lot of good stuff. Uh, Moody's Investment Agency agrees, uh, wind farms boost tax base for local governments. Uh, new operating revenues, lowering the tax burden, people like to hear that. We don't have many numbers for solar yet, but for our leading wind counties, uh, Huron, Tuscola, or Gratiot, Huron, Tuscola, plus 38, plus 34, plus 26 percent in their tax base between 2011 and 2015, while the rest of the state averaged about a percent. And a lot of counties went negative during that time. 
So that's money uh, for a lot of things. This is Doug Merchant, who is the assessor for three townships down in Gratiot. I'll let him tell the story here. Uh, this is my 31st year as an assessor. Uh, as far as the wind turbines coming into the community, we have, uh, I have not seen any differences uh, with the community. It's generated uh, revenue. The townships have been able to go out and do more road projects, uh, fire projects uh, for their communities, uh, which has helped the taxpayers because it's reduced their uh, millage rates. So also the same thing is true for schools. Uh, this is Sarah Mills. Uh, Sarah is, has become a new friend of mine. She is a uh, PhD at the University of Michigan, uh, 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 rural and urban development specialist uh, at the uh, Gerald Ford School there. She's developing a national reputation for her studies of the interaction of renewable energy and local communities. This is, uh, so you're going to see here talking uh, about schools, and you're also going to see Dr. Jan Amsterberg, who is the superintendent of Gratiot Isabella Intermediate School District. So the same thing is true on schools. If you're just able to maintain services, that's more than what a lot of local governments across the state are, are able to do right now. Just because they have the cost for keeping the schools operating is increasing, but their revenues aren't necessarily increasing. So being able to maintain services or introduce new services, hire more teachers, is just something that um, that most local governments in the state don't have the luxury of doing. That in places that have wind farms, they have been able to maintain, if not improve, some services. What has the impact of, of the local wind development been on the local school districts? Wind, the wind development has been significant. Um, it's allowed us to uh, keep program funding uh, roughly the same level, and we haven't had to decrease funding as other uh, ISDs have had to do uh, in the economic downturn. Um, it's allowed us to keep programs whole, uh, get a lot of benefit to our uh, to our local communities. So, uh, in Huron, in Huron County, the uh, uh, paper up there, Huron Daily Tribune, reported in 2015 about just what the breakdown was and where the wind turbine revenue was going. Uh, in 2014, Elkton Pigeon Bayport Laker Schools got a million bucks, uh, in which the superintendent said it makes a huge impact. Uh, so they're redoing their technology, they're adding robotics, and it's costing the taxpayers only about half as much as it would. Their enrollment up there, that's a really cool school, you should go up there and take a look, by the way. Um, they're getting 20% of their total enrollment from school of choice, which I think is very interesting. It keeps going up. Uh, and if you've ever been up there, that's they're nestled right in among the wind turbines there. So 20% of the people, of the parents, have chosen to send their kids there because they think that that school there, nestled right among the wind turbines, is, I, I presume, uh, the safest, the best equipped, the most conducive place for those kids to get a great start in life. And uh, so they're seeing, for instance, a new uh, sports field house, 50,000 square foot, that is world class. And so these kids are going to have access to facilities that are usually reserved for much more urban uh, school settings. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Mills project at the University of Michigan uh, looked at, uh, this happens to be about Gratiot, and in Gratiot County they're able to add special education, speech therapists, reading specialists, and school psychologists, fiber internet network, and transportation for dual uh, programs. So this is, again, something that uh, these small districts just simply can't do. And so over time, we expect that this uh, is going to have an impact on the kids. And indeed, we're now starting to get some numbers. The Toledo Blade reported on a community in Paulding, Ohio, Paulding County, Ohio, where they've had wind turbines now for a long enough time that a generation of kids has come through the schools. And they're seeing a higher percentage of students graduating, more scored in advanced and accelerated categories since uh, revenue from the wind uh, terms started coming in. Uh, the the uh, superintendent says he's uh, hired 18 additional staffers, mostly for special needs and intervention. 
uh, and they got almost uh, almost a million bucks uh, in the last fiscal year. So that's uh, that's pretty impressive, and it means that uh, wind turbines are actually making kids smarter. <laughs> but which is I'm serious because because as we burn when we burn stuff when we burn coal and oil and gas. We create, we're putting toxins in the air that, that lead to delayed development, to brain damage, and to increased dementia. So, so burning fossil fuels makes us stupid. Renewable energy makes us smarter. Uh, and same story uh, from uh, LaSalle, Illinois. Uh, wind, wind farms giving schools a boost. Uh, not a lot of new businesses coming in, maintaining and programs and enriching education uh, is uh, great. It's helping them with some of the best buildings and grounds in the area. And um, so, that network. Yes? I have a question to clarify. Sure. The money for the schools, for instance, they get more money because the having the wind farm there increases the property value, or they also save money by being by having electricity coming from the wind farm directly? No. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's part of their tax base. Okay. So, so and, and that's a, actually, you're touching on a really great thing because it's not as obvious as it should be. But basically, uh, the, the money, say, for Midland Public Schools, mm -hmm. there's a millage in Midland, and we all pay into it. And what happens to that money is that it goes to Lansing and then they divide it all up into equal parts and it comes back. Right. So uh, that, in that case, you know, say a wind turbine would not do you a whole lot of good. But it's these intermediate school districts which roughly correspond, but not exactly, to the county lines. Uh, they have their own separate millage. And that millage stays local. And so that's extra money that allows uh, creative uh, community leaders to move it around and apply it to uh, areas where they where they need it. Yes. In Michigan, what that money does more than anything, like they said, is buildings and grounds. Because if you get more money, the state just gives you less as far as every day. Right. But right. But the capital improvements, and when you have money to do your buildings and maintain your buildings, then your general fund money can go Bingo. to education. Bingo, bingo, that's right. And so, I don't know about Illinois so it's, or Ohio. Yeah, it's different in other states. But, but so the, the money that comes from the ISDs typically does not go directly to edu educational programs. But it frees up money that can then you can hire teachers and do all and, kinds of good and stuff. They were, when they were talking about Michigan, they talked about bonds and right. buildings and equipment. Sinking funds. So sink, sinking yep. funds. So that in Michigan, that's where they were really out. That's right. That's right. And 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 that's what we're seeing. You know. Yeah. So and this is this is the message that we're trying to get out. And there's people out there that are lying about. That I've had to confront, and, and it's it's amazing. So anyway, the network, the future that we're looking at, is this this network that looks something like the internet, but is actually even maybe even bigger and more profound uh, in its impact. Um, and uh, to give you an idea of how a power engineer looks at this. I, I got this from the uh, uh, Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado. So here's two maps of the United States, and we're looking at wind resource here, solar resource here, okay? So we're starting at night, so there's no solar resource, got it? Now there tends to be a little bit more wind at night, so that you're seeing that here. And I'm going to start moving, and I want you to look at this, and I want you to think about, okay, wind turbines, solar panels, batteries, good transmission, moving it around. So watch, here's the wind coming up, here comes the sun, wind goes down, sun goes down, 
the wind comes up. Wind goes down, the sun comes up. We started to get this. <laughs> this is where this is where the, the pump storage and the lithium ion and the, the car batteries and the increasing network of energy transmission and storage starts to make it possible to have a grid that is based on, on sun and wind and not a whole lot else. And not that far in the future. The, the uh, guys that I have talked to from this lab say just 15, 20 years ago, it was hard to see how you could get much more than 20% of renewable onto your grid. It just couldn't quite make the technological leap for how you would do it. Now they're saying we can see our way clear to 70, 80, maybe even 90%. But we know that this technology is going to continue to change. You know, we're pretty sure we can get to 80, 90 percent right now with the technology we have today. But uh, it, it is a, it, this is an ongoing disruption that we're in the middle of. And I'm going to leave you with uh, this is a recording that I made at Isabella County Planning Commission last January. The Planning Commission was meeting to. Uh, a vote on a special use permit for what will be the largest wind farm in the state, uh, almost 400 megawatts, which is ginormous for a wind farm. Um, and they had uh, a lot of people there, a lot of people from the community showed up in support, uh, a few uh, to, to, uh, to boo. But the most, uh, the, the one, statement, the one person that really brought down the house was not a local politician or an expert or a professor at the university or, or any particular noteworthy person. It was a, a simple farmer from Rosebush, Michigan, John Fabian. Uh, the sound is not very good, but I've got some uh, captions up there. You'll be able to follow what he's saying. And I think his message was, uh, you'll see uh, why it was so powerful. Hello, my name is John Bacon, 6531, East Vernon Road, in And my family has been supportive of this, and probably for a different reason than anybody in this room. See, in 2004, our son Eric Bacon is an 18 year old United States Marine sent to the country of Iraq, combat duty, in a region called the Triangle of Death. And after seven months of combat, he returned. He still has physical and emotional scars from that duty. And the reason we all know these men were sent there was for energy in the form of crude oil. And 15 years later, we still send our young people to the Middle East for crude oil. And projects like this have create the energy right here that's going to be used here, not put in a tanker and sent around the world. These are the projects we need. And so Baymax is willing to partner with our family and put a windmill or a wind turbine on our property. If you're willing to do that, so maybe it will keep some other family from seeing their son or daughter sent to these foreign lands energy when we can produce it right here. So, yeah, um, so we can, uh, that's moving, we're going to have, um, <clears throat> so we can, we can uh, have more Q&A, uh, we can, uh, I've got uh, other uh, resources that I can pull out if, if uh, anybody wants to discuss them, yeah. Birds and the bats. We can talk about birds and bats. Let's talk about birds and bats. Sure.
Okay, so uh, I talked to uh, well a number of experts because this is one of the things that comes up and, and uh, even President Trump was talking about uh, wind materials and they were uh, really bad for birds. Um, it turns out that the Audubon Society, which uh, they like birds. Uh, has a, a statement on wind energy, and they strongly support properly cited uh, wind power. Uh, they recognize that you know basically any kind of human structure is going to have an impact on living things. But they just came out with a, uh, a study just last week that uh, has a rather dire scenario for birds going forward if global temperatures continue to rise even, even to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial. Uh, they're looking at something like, uh, I think it's two-thirds of the species at risk of extinction. Not just killing individuals, but extinct species. And that's something like half of the species in Michigan are at risk. Uh, Gary George uh, is uh, the expert uh, on this issue. Uh, I talked to him at a meeting a few months ago. It's Gary George. I'm the Renewable Energy Director for our National Audubon Society. We support wind energy and solar energy when it is cited and operated properly to avoid, minimize, and mitigate effectively for the birds. Why do we support renewable energy? 314 species of birds are seriously threatened to lose their breeding or wintering ranges um, by 2020, 2050, or 2080, depending on three different emission scenarios. When we're not doing so good reducing our emissions, we need to reduce them faster. And one of the ways to do that is renewable energy when it's properly cited. So we support renewable energy, including wind energy. Uh, so I also talked to uh, some of my, uh, my new friends who are uh, uh, local officials here in Gratiot and Huron uh, County, and I just, I, I asked them about a whole range of questions, and this was one of the questions that I asked them. Uh, I'll, I'll let you just uh, hear for yourself. Yes, there were a lot of concerns and questions. Uh, People were a little bit concerned about uh, uh, some any problems that they would cause with noise, killing birds or animals, how they react to, for the wildlife and, and uh, owls and bats and th different things like that. From my experience, uh, the wildlife blends right in with them because I, when I hunt deer, uh, the deer are all sometimes grazing right underneath the turbine. Went to a meeting on this topic several years ago. A man stood up and told us that the wildlife would all leave. All we'd ever see was a crow occasionally, and they would never come back. And the fish were leaving Saginaw Bay. We hear that you know they're killing the birds, uh, but yet show us the dead birds. I guess we haven't seen any. The effect that wildlife to me has been zero. Uh, when I was hunting last year, they had just started up a day or two before that. Deer came out practically underneath the thing, never paid a bit of attention to it. Livestock is the same thing. They didn't pay no attention to the noise that the wind turbines generate, which is very little noise. No impact that uh, anyone has brought to our attention on livestock or wildlife. Um, again, our, our neighbors in Bethany have understood the uh, livestock uh, feeding facility that's essentially directly underneath the turbine. The guy that owns the land, owns the cattle, you know, leases the turbines, but no complaints. He's doubled the size of his cattle operation since that for about 80 years ago. You know, has, has no concerns, no complaints, no conjecture that uh, somehow that's causing new problems. When I hunt, I, I go right in park right next to some of the wind turbines sometimes. And, uh, I use the roads for access, actually. I've never seen any dead birds under any of the turbines. You know, the turkeys will come right up and, and graze right underneath of the turbines. They don't really have any fear of them or uh, they never hurt harm them. I think animals 
have senses that humans do not. I mean, I know they do. And if the animals do not feel any vibration, any shadow flicker, any et cetera, et cetera, all these boogeyman's, the, the sky is falling, chicken little kind of thing, that tells me that they're not real. I mean, if the animals were scattering and they were looking and they were trembling, I'd say, oh, there's something to that. I have seen none of that from domestic or wild animals. Well, the, the eagle seem to be on an upswing around this area right now. So uh, we're seeing more than we used to. It used to be pretty rare to see an eagle. Uh, you know, the league actually visited a uh, record and went inside. Oh, yeah. And went, you know, they talked to us. Yeah. And they gave us a number, and it was 1.7, 1. 1. something. Less than two birds per wind turbine per year. I kill more with my windows. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, and, and, and you know, there's, there's no question, there's no question that, that you know, uh, this is an issue that wind uh, uh, developers are concerned about. And, and the, the, I went to a meeting uh, a few months ago in Albuquerque where this was the topic, you know, uh, birds, bats, and uh, some of the technologies that they're looking at are, are pretty impressive. Uh, for instance, we all know that bats navigate with high frequency sound, and they're starting to apply some uh, sound, uh, again, sound that you and I can't hear to some of these turbines to see if they can keep away bats, and they're seeing, it's, it's not ready yet, it's just experimentally, but they're seeing uh, uh, decline in, in uh, deaths, depending on species, anywhere from 50 to 90 percent. You know, so we're seeing some pretty impressive work on that, and I think I've got a couple of graphs like this, maybe you've seen them, uh, compared to all the other things that kill birds, and make no mistake, we've got a problem with birds. We've got to stop killing birds. But if you're concerned about birds, keep your darn kitty cats inside. Uh, you know, I was taking a tour of the building here yesterday, and in fact, yeah, we were coming in this room, and I looked out this window, and there's a little kitty cat. I said, you got a kitty cat out there? And, they, and, and the lady said, yeah, people think that this is a safe place where they can <laughs> throw their cats that they're tired of, and they'll just, yeah, sure, they come and they hunt at the bird feeder out here, and eventually they get eaten by the coyotes. So don't let your cats outside, okay, because they will get eaten by coyotes. Yes? Well, this is not on the subject of birds. Sure. <laughs> um, I read an article a couple of years ago that these uh, cloud storage facilities on the whole southern tier of the United States, from the west coast to the east coast, are moving up into Canada because of their desperate needs for cooling of these huge... The, the, the days are... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that they're jumping over the Midwest going up into Canada, and not just Ontario and the lower tier, but way up. Way up. Yeah. Do you think that projects like Switch are the hope for the in you know for those those types of facilities in the hotter parts of the United States? They come to it because they are renewable energy um, centers, and 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 that's where they're going to be getting their supply of power rather than having to go up and rely on cold weather to do it. It'll well, be cheaper to stay in the United States. Well, it's, you know, there's, I've, I've seen some of those same reports. Uh, you know, I don't think that that's a, I, it, it's probably a factor. I don't think it's a leading factor. I, I saw a, a presentation by Switch, uh, and one of the reasons they chose Grand Rapids as well as three other uh, locations throughout the United States was uh, renewable energy, yes, but also uh, geological stability and relative uh, climate stability going forward. Because Michigan is actually not too bad of a place. I mean, we're having impacts, but compared to California, you know, Florida, Texas, uh, relatively minor impacts, at least for the next few decades, or at least manageable impacts. Uh, 
and, and this is something that a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, the, the anti-wind, and I, I can't emphasize this enough how, how intense these guys are. This is a news report from Iowa where apparently the, the local uh, anti-wind group decided that the dark winter just weren't killing enough birds and decided to take matters into their own hands. Watch this. A local landowner found more than a dozen dead rabbits at the base of a wind turbine on his property. Now we do want to warn you, you might find this video graphic. A combination of white and black rabbits were scattered under the propellers of a wind turbine just north of Greeley this afternoon. The property is owned by an area farmer and leased by RPM Access, a company with several wind farms in Iowa. KWWL's Jessica Hartman was at the scene earlier this evening, spoke with the Delaware County Sheriff's Department. Jessica. This is just nuts. The WDF scene telling me they do believe the 15 rabbits that were killed were killed purposely and placed under the tip turbine. 15 rabbits with shiny white and black coats, their lifeless bodies scattered through the freshly harvested field, directly under the swift moving propellers of a wind turbine. I don't understand who would do something like this. I really don't. Um, and the abundance of 15 bodies laid on the ground like this under one turbine, it's, it's pretty shocking. Linda Slobodnik is an environmental consultant for RPM Access, the company who owns the wind farm. In more than 10 years in the wind energy industry, she says this is the most disgusting thing she has seen. Their necks were snapped, so I believe they were brought in. And likely domestic rabbits by the cleanliness and the color of their coats. Slobodnik believes they were likely placed under the turbine to attract eagles and other birds into the path of the propellers. If eagles were attracted in, there was a higher possibility that they could be hit. Something Slobodnik's work centers around preventing, including picking up roadkill and monitoring wildlife in the area to prevent animal deaths. I think there's folks that uh, that that will, will speak against the, the wind turbine, but, but I think a lot of what they do is, is out of ignorance. Both RPM Access project manager Kevin Lees and Slobodnik believe this was done by someone who does not support wind energy. A lot of anti-wind people, and uh, at the time, we're looking at new places to for projects, and I'm thinking that possibly somebody would like us to not build another wind farm in the area. The company is currently looking to get approval for a wind farm in southern Blackhawk County, the first wind farm proposed in the county by another company was shot down several years ago. Blackhawk remains a windless county. Jessica Hartman, News 7, KWWL. So Jessica, now the Delaware County Sheriff's Office is going to be increasing patrols in the Greeley area, and they ask anyone with any information about this case to please contact them. So, yeah, it's ugly out there. Uh, it's, it's shocking, actually. Yeah. Peter, we switch on the lights. I'm not sure what the, the mix is, how much is, is uh, gas and how much is wind and solar and everything. But, so what does it mean when, when a company agrees to site someplace and they say they want 100% renewable energy? Well, it's sort of a, it's a convenient uh, uh, accounting fiction, sort of. And it's basically, if you think of the grid as like a lake, and uh, okay, I'm going to take two buckets out on this end of the lake and I agree to pay you to put two buckets in over on the other end of the lake. And, you know, it's not as if... So, it, so when they make that agreement there, the part of the agreement is if that much more renewable capacity is going to be built that isn't there already? Right, right. So, for instance, there was a, 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 line, a headline in the paper a couple months ago that the Detroit Zoo was uh, making a contract to uh, to run themselves on renewable energy, okay? And so the rumor went out on Facebook that, well, they're going to suck all of our energy down there to the dang zoo, you yeah, know? Right, right. And uh, that's, that's not the way it works. It's basically, uh, once that energy goes onto the grid, it follows the path of least resistance, sure. just like water. So the sure. nearest open switch, whether it's here in Midland or down in Grand Rapids or wherever, right. that's where it goes. Sure. And, uh, that's, the agreement yeah. is to build more capacity. Yeah. Okay. I have a similar question. Sure. Uh, earlier on, you, you talked about the state of Iowa uh, with a great potential of 
to the extent that some major high-tech companies were looking at Iowa for building plants, um, I'm kind of curious, uh, who is running uh, the development there in Iowa? Would it be co-ops or commercial power companies? Uh, you know, Iowa generates a tremendous uh, volume of ethanol from corn, and that's energy intensive. So I'm wondering, you know, what kind of a mix do we have here? <coughs> that's a great question. Uh, what I can tell you is that Iowa's getting something like 37% of their power from wind, and that's as a total. In other words, they generate so many million megawatt hours a year, and of that, 37% is from wind. Uh, an increasing percentage is from solar, because solar is really taking off in Iowa. So there must be close to about 40% Renewable. So among states, uh, Iowa is probably the, has the highest percentage of electricity coming from renewables. <coughs> Kansas is pretty close and climbing up the charts. Texas, as 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 just sheer volume, has the largest production of wind and solar of any state. But because it's so gigantic, percentage as a percentage is small. But, but they have an enormous amount of uh, wind and solar going in there. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, but as far as how that uh, fits in with, uh, with ethanol production, I couldn't even tell you. you know. mm -hmm. Yes? Are you familiar with the uh, commuter parking lot at Michigan State University? Mm -hmm. I'm the whole parking lot has solar panels over every parking position. It's a gigantic parking lot. Right. Um, the university must be benefiting by supplying some part of their energy. I, I would think. I would think. Uh, and I would hope that we're going to see more of that. Right now, Michigan's in kind of a, a funny position regulatory-wise because uh, the, we haven't been quite as friendly for smaller developments like that, say for a college or a business or even for a home, to, to uh, have solar panels and then be able to sell that back on the grid at a favorable rate. Okay, And uh, the argument that the utilities make is, look, we got to maintain this grid we need to get a fair, you know, what we consider a fair payback, and we'd rather build these big uh, arrays, these big wind and solar farms, because we think the economies of scale are really uh, uh, compelling. Uh, my own personal opinion is that the logic of the technology, uh, particularly as batteries get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, is going to push us in the direction of more and more of that kind of development, you know, at, uh, say, a university scale or a business scale or even like home or small business scales. I, I think that's coming, but I, I, we might be, you know, five or ten years away from figuring it all out uh, from the regulatory and political side of things. The northeastern states are much more supportive of yeah. funding yeah. people for New Jersey is a leader, Vermont is a leader, you know, California, of course, Colorado, you, you know, and, and I think that just like just like everything else, you know, that some of the states get out ahead and they kind of lead the charge. So uh, I'm just, from my, my standpoint, is anybody that's got the resources and the technical know-how to, to deploy renewable energy at scale, I'm, I'm I'm there. I'm all for them, you know. And I think the more that we push and get it out there, the more people get familiar with it, the more lawmakers kind of feel comfortable with it. Uh, we're going to see, eventually, somebody's going to figure out the formula. I don't think anybody says, here's a state or there's a state that has the magic formula, you know. But uh, the technology keeps changing and evolving. And maybe in a decade, I think we're going to see something that looks... Once we get a critical mass of electric cars on the road and stuff like that, I think you know, just there's going to be a, a huge momentum in that direction. I think, I think 
One more question? Or anybody? I think you want to say thank you very much for being here.